You're listening to a free audio download from Venue Cymru's International Concert Series. Welcome to the March edition of Pre-Concert Interviews from Venue Cymru. This month saw the BBC National Orchestra of Wales, along with soloist Vilda Frang, tackle the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, Prokofiev's Classical Symphony, as well as Haydn's very last symphony, number 104. Before the concert, we caught up with principal guest conductor Jack Van Steen. Now, as I said, your full title is principal guest conductor of the orchestra. Would you tell us a little bit more about what this title might mean? Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the BBC National Orchestra of Wales has a certain strategy mm. to work with conductors that the orchestra likes and that the management likes and conductors that like the orchestra, ending up with a system that for this orchestra works very well. You have a principal conductor, mm -hmm. then you have a principal guest conductor, then you have an honored conductor, then you have a special conductor for youth <laughs> project. So there are five of us covering about 75, 80% of the season. Mm -hmm. And the principal guest conductor is in two ways different from the principal conductor that I am only seven weeks and a week can be four days can be like this week touring mm -hmm. can be seven days with like a studio recording CD recording and a concert in St. David's Hall in Cardiff so a week is not just work it can mm -hmm. be a variety of, uh, of aspects and the big difference with the principal conductor, who is 10, 11 weeks with this orchestra, or even more, uh, the difference is that I have no responsibility in terms of if you say, well, we need new principal oboe, then there will be auditions. Mm -hmm. It's not me that is sitting in in the auditions. They ask the principal guest conductor, because I know them very well, and they ask advice, but you're not responsible. Mm -hmm. And if I compare that to my principal job, which is an opera house, uh, just to, to sort of form this a bit for you, it is 23 weeks I have to be in the opera house, and that's really 23 weeks per year. And that is full responsibility. Well, it's a German opera house, so there is no decision without the chief. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, if one singer wants to have a day off, I get a form with... Uh. <laughs> and I have to sign uh, at the bottom whether he or she is allowed to leave. And that administrative sort of um, non-musical aspect of the conductor's mm. métier is a relief not having that in the <laughs> <laughs> It's very hard work, but here it's only about music and about, I must say this week, about nature. If you, well you know, you live here, but <laughs> if I come from Bangor to where we were yesterday, can't, can't pronounce it, Wrexham, Wrexham. and mm -hmm. then uh, from Aberystwyth to Bangor, <laughs> I mean this nature is an inspiration, an extra inspiration country-wise, for the concerts we do. Excellent. Um, you also conduct a number of different orchestras as well. So how do you manage your time between them all? It is um, a certain way of life. It is a mm. habit to live uh, out of my suitcase. Mm. So some colleagues say, how can you survive? Because I'm doing this now for 30 years. Mm. And um, I have a strong family feeling. So my wife, and I, in my world, so to speak, are uh, already 33 years together since uh, Conservatoire. She's a very strong character and she supports me in everything I do because she knows I'm a megaloman, I'm a music fanatic. She's a very good musician as well. But she decided, I stay at home, you do your work and come as soon as you can, mm. come back and as often as you can. And then we have party time and we have a few days <laughs> off in nature. I, I live in a nature reserve and two days down to earth gives me all the energy to literally fly away again. So it is, sometimes I wished I had three weeks on a row off, which yeah. never happens. No. <laughs> it never happens for a conductor. And on the other hand, I mean, it would not be good if I would have so much free time mm. and with orchestras like the BBC National Orchestra of Wales. 
you can imagine, it's a joy for us. They want to work, they want to do the best. And we have a fantastic program, we have lovely musicians. So, with all respect for other professions, but I feel so lucky yeah. to be the one who can be in front of 90 <laughs> talented young people, although some are older than I, but music keeps you, <laughs> music keeps you young and fit. <laughs> Um, is it common for conductors to hold positions at several orchestras at the same time? It's a new age thing. It's something of the last sort of 10, 15 years, mm. I think. If you compare that to earlier times, not to speak about the 19th century, where there was one conductor living almost in the opera house or in the, in the, in the city where the concert orchestra was, uh, training that orchestra, forming that, being part of social life, uh, like going to important sponsor activities, political activities. Um, nowadays, we used to combine. And perhaps it's also modern times. It goes faster and orchestras know conductors very, very quick. I mean, there's always this joke, um, a conductor needs five minutes to <laughs> get to know an orchestra. And the joke back is an orchestra needs one minute to get to know the, the conductor. <laughs> So in this speedy time we live, about my experiences, um, and I hope they're still after seven years, they're happy to see me back. Mm. And if I go for a month now, I don't come back this season anymore. So if I come back in autumn, it is like refreshing for me and for them as well. Instead of every day, yeah. every week, then it's sort of the risk. It's not everywhere, but it's the risk of having an office job. Mm. And many conductors have different positions, <coughs> and it's not, uh, don't get this wrong, it's not because of the money, because the money is just partly interesting. Mm. It is the fact that you have two or three positions to be responsible, and that's where we are, are there for. Yeah. Now, since each orchestra is different, you know, each one perhaps plays slightly behind the beat than another one, um, how do you essentially break the ice, especially as a, um, a guest conductor? How do you get through that? Because perhaps you'll only have, you know, one rehearsal maybe, or... Well, we have, uh, for this tour, we take two completely different programs. Mm -hmm. So we have three days of rehearsals, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then go on tour. The time is limited, but it gives also a certain excitement. Mm -hmm. If you have too much time, you mm -hmm. get lost in a labyrinth of trying to find mistakes that perhaps are not there. And... Um, in terms of characters of playing, I'm Dutch and I'm in the middle, uh, geographically, of the UK and Germany, artistically also. The German orchestra, orchestras tend to play very, very far behind my beat. So you end up with energy, you build up and you give a beat and then the orchestra comes about a second later <laughs> together and, and, and sort of I can already uh, um, unbutton and they play the last chord. Um, and that has a reason. German orchestras um, spend a lot of energy in their sound world and the later the orchestra reacts on my gestures, on my hands, the larger and the broader the sound develops. The more direct a sound comes on the click of the beat, you loosen uh, a certain way of sound building. Now the British orchestras, especially the BBC orchestras, because they have every concert and every rehearsal mic'd, there's a microphone, mm -hmm. if it's not together, you as an auditeur, as a, as a listener would say, huh, what's this, this is not together. In a live situation today, if there is one bar a bit sort of disjoint, mm -hmm. Um, it's no problem at all, it's the emotion and the music and the good weather and whatever. <laughs> but on the radio, BBC orchestras can't afford to make those silly basic mistakes. Mm. Now, what I do is, and that's what I wanted to say with being Dutch, I am a, a chameleon in the middle, I go to an orchestra and I know them very well and they know me very well, so we come together. But the good things of the BBC world speak of timing, playing together, in tune, microphone, CD ripe, those good elements I transport to Germany and combine it with this sort of operatic, late playing, say, no, uh, on the beat, fit, microphone is there, although it's just fantasy because an opera orchestra doesn't work with microphones, not a radio orchestra. From the German world with this huge sound, 
I can't show that to a bit in the Schumann, I must say, a bit in the Schumann, because the repertoire for today is very classical, it's not romantic. But mm -hmm. the romantic sound of my German orchestra in the city of Dortmund is so rich for Bruckner, for Dvorak, for Tchaikovsky, for Wagner, for Strauss. If I have that experience in my body, I transport it to the British orchestras and to this orchestra, I don't rehearse on bars mm -hmm. or numbers or figures or tones, I only rehearse on quality of playing. So the German quality of, of warmth and largo playing, I bring to this orchestra. And that's perhaps one of the reasons that they ask me to come with that mm -hmm. romantic mm -hmm. Elgar, Strauss, Brahms repertoire. Excellent. Um, you also teach conducting with the Royal Conservatoire in The Hague, along with visits to the Royal Northern College of Music and the Chetham School of Music. Yeah. Um, is conducting something that is taught at a young, at a young age, um, sort of with instrumental lessons? It's an interesting question. We have um, uh, different characters of conductors in our mm -hmm. class. Um, I love to work with youth orchestras because that keeps us fit. It's three rehearsals a day instead of two. They never get tired instead of <laughs> after two rehearsals, always tired. Uh, they never complain. There are no union rules. So, <laughs> and it's a sort of, um, of an energy boost, mm. like working with ballet is one of, of the things. I, I didn't work for 20 years with the ballet company, but I'm going to work with it again because they know after I'm 35 as a ballet dancer, uh, my life is going to change. So they need this enormous energy. Young people have, of course, the same, as, as you all know. Teaching... Um, I can have young conductors around the age of 20, mm -hmm. and then I have to see a bit like, like in the big uh, uh, glass, uh, what is it, ball, ball yeah. uh, whether they in four, five, six years are able to stand up for a mm -hmm. band like professionals. And that's one type of conductors, and I love that type of conductors the most to teach, because they are green and you can do anything with them, and it's very hygienic for myself because I see a conductor doing something silly <laughs> and I think how would I solve that problem <laughs> and there's another type of conductors that often happens and they find a way also musicians in an orchestra think they can conduct so they come to me and say oh you teach yes I teach may I because I have an mm -hmm. amateur orchestra or a university orchestra and then they realize how difficult it is so sometimes I'm more of a sort of a guardian for them and say listen perhaps not stay in the orchestra and after a few years uh, it will it will work out by itself whether you can stand up and be a yeah. conductor because it's it's a real profession mm -hmm. and uh, there are a lot of psychological aspects a lot of historical aspect interpretation aspect it's not only taking up the baton and sort of beating mm. a bar so you said that you you teach sort of age 20 is that sort of the age you think conducting should be taught at or do you think you could yeah the earlier the better earlier? It's, it's a mixture um, the students I have have an obligation to also have finished a, uh, um, a violin playing mm -hmm. or piano playing or singing or whatever so they have to be musician first yeah. and then go into conducting and I hardly ever have a student that did not finish a an instrument an mm -hmm. instrumental study and that is because of, of several reasons I do that. Um, because one reason is, if the conducting doesn't work, uh, what do they do? Mm -hmm. If they are a good fiddle player, they can audition for an orchestra or a flute player, or they can teach or whatever. If they don't have this musical aspect, then for their lives I feel responsible also, how mm -hmm. they go into society. And the other aspect is that if they start too young, then it's 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 very hard to uh, get all these aspects of conducting in view. Mm. So it's always, and every conductor in my class I treat as one person. I don't have a class and six, I maximum is six because I can't teach more than one day a month because of the traveling. But um, I have six students and I treat them all six as individual, individual identities. Mm -hmm. So it's not you have to clone uh, what I do, you do that, okay, it fits for you. For you, that doesn't fit. We, mm -hmm. So we do different repertoire with different uh, people. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, since 20 years I tried in Holland to establish a real good school for conductors and since September we found a sponsor. <coughs> And the sponsor enables the students, the two master students I have, 
to go to orchestras and they pay for the travel mm -hmm. and for the books and for the staying in the hotels and the students go to different orchestras. They go to eight orchestras in Holland and they sit in a whole week and if the conductor is a good colleague, I call him and say, listen, if you have 15 minutes, give him a chance. <laughs> and it, it works yeah. because there's always 15 minutes. <laughs> and the orchestra loves it because then they have, oh, well, okay, they are clever because yeah. you see, if this is a new talent, we can sort of in the future, uh, we are the first to help him. And that's, that's a thing that now works with a big sponsor. It, it, it's, it's expensive, but um, it, it, will, it will pay off. I think I need five years to have a sort of an international conducting school. Fantastic. Now, unlike uh, instrumentalists, conductors can't just pick up their instrument to have a practice since the orchestra essentially is their instrument. So, in your experience, how often do you think students get the chance to actually work with an orchestra? And what can they do otherwise if they can't get hold of them? Yeah, it is, um, it's a big problem. It's like studying the piano and uh, you don't have the black keys. <laughs> because I teach in class uh, with two pianos and the pianos play the symphonies or whatever we, we uh, rehearse. Um, in this scheme, what I just told you about, they get a chance, although it's only 15 minutes a week or they assist me and they come and sit in here and they learn. Um, ideally, they would have a master class, not too often, because also they have to reflect on it. If they would conduct every, every week, it wouldn't help, because it has to sink in somehow. I would be happy, like a month ago, I could do two days with one of the finest orchestras in Amsterdam, not a concertgebouw, but the second orchestra of the town. And we did two days with three students. They had the time of their life. And also the orchestra had the mm. time of their life. And therefore, a month they can sort of inhale it once again and say, okay, this is what we did. It's all videoed. And then the next step would be to go to another orchestra. And if that would be once a month, a whole season, a whole year, so they have sort of ten possibilities, then I think they are like, like a good knight that has to uh, armor itself for, for you know, knowing the, the way how to treat the musicians, the music, the baton, the physical aspect. It's a process, and I think um, the more orchestras, and in, in Great Britain it's fantastic, because you get a lot of assistances, mm -hmm. like uh, English National Opera has an assistant, Liverpool has an assistant, Manchester, Halle has an assistant. Um, we don't work with an assistant, but we have these five or six conductors, mm -hmm. and the fifth or sixth is a conductor that starts with family and youth projects. He doesn't start with Mahler Five or Prokofiev Classical Symphony. <laughs> he starts with... so. Every conductor needs to be built up. Mm. If you go too fast up, uh, like Icarus, you will fall mm. down. And uh, we all know the young conductors of this um, this time. Uh, the I, I forgot his name now because I, I, the Venezuelan. Oh, uh, Gustavo Dudamel. Dudamel. He is an example for a lot of conductors mm. uh, that think, oh, conducting is so lovely. You stand up and you have beautiful hair and you do something. <laughs> Nothing against Dudamel. But it's not, it's a, cert a certain energy that he brings. If you ask him to compare uh, Schumann with uh, Brahms in Opus 36, he would be completely blanco. Mm. Nevertheless, it's a very good conductor. Mm. Yeah. So, but there are other things. Uh, so the youngsters must not must not think. Oh, if I'm young and energetic, I can be a conductor. <laughs> he was very lucky, and he was very good. But <coughs> that's only one in five mm. years yeah. you, find, you find a young conductor like that. <laughs> now, this is your chance in the audience to ask Shaq any questions you might have today. And who will be our first victim? <laughs> I admit volunteer. I'm sorry. Please. I'm rather interested in the, the touring routine that happens with an orchestra like this. You must have to enter a different acoustic perhaps every night. I just wonder, is there any way that you can adjust the way the orchestra plays to accommodate the differences yeah. in the acoustic? Yeah, there is in this tour, because I've, I've, I've been to Bangor before, but I've never been here. And the contrasts in this tour have never been as big as mm. a boomy acoustic, very loud and very over acoustic, three seconds echoey, and the driest. I mean, my farm house has a better acoustic in, in terms than. So, what, uh, what we do is, because there is no acoustic, 
So it's, I mean, the technicians are happy. They put on mics and they do a button cathedral or button concept <laughs> and, and you will hear next week in Radio Cymru, you will, you will hear a, 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 a different acoustic than now the live experience. But we have every day a two-hour rehearsal. And because today it was the fourth day of the tour and they sort of, and I want to say you are very good, so we did one hour, but in one hour I listened with them to the acoustic, the orchestra knows it better than I do, and I adjust the way of playing a little bit. So in dry acoustics I asked to do a little bit more sound, a little bit more vibrato, a little bit more uh, uh, dynamic coloring, and in the big acoustic I ask in Bangor to articulate far more, to, to spit out <coughs> all the things that, and then I listen in the hall, I let them play alone, and for 10 bars it's fine, and luckily uh, the 12th bar didn't work, so I, oh, thank God I'm not useless. <laughs> but I, I sat in the hall for five minutes, and, and as we are experienced and we know how to deal with acoustics, we go for the music, I want you to enjoy the scores that we bring. And in whatever acoustic it is, we have to play. And I, I, as a young conductor, I thought, oh, I go to the Halley Orchestra, and uh, it will be in Bridgewater Hall. Or, you know. And then you come the first rehearsal, and they rehearse in a university school, because Bridgewater Hall wasn't free. And then you have an orchestra like this room, far too flat, leveled, leveled out. I, I, I didn't know, but that's reality. The moment they go into Bridgewater Hall, we rehearse an hour, and there the music, it was a broken symphony. I never forget that, because I was shocked. And that's all experience also. So we, we adapt ourselves very quickly, like a chameleon, uh, to, um, to the hall that we are making music in. Okay. Is there, is there another question in the audience? Yes, please, the video. Uh, <clears throat> I'm interested in the repertoire of the conductor and the orchestra you go to conduct. Who chooses the pieces to be played in a concert? And does it leave you with a lot of homework to do, studying scores beforehand? How much work do you have to do? That's a very, very, the very interesting question. Um, at a certain age and at a certain renommé, uh, conductors are able to choose what they conduct. So I don't conduct music that I don't want to conduct. But that is since 10 years, perhaps. So I'm 55 now. And as a young conductor, I advise every young conductor to take whatever, if it's Mahler, if it's new music, if it's children's music, don't care. Do it. That's your experience. Uh, most of the time, we deal with, with programmers in uh, orchestra organizations or in opera organizations. And they have a whole sort of season um, in view. And they know, and that's a bit of, of our fate of conductors, they know what they think you as a conductor are good at. So if they want me to do Haydn, because the orchestra hardly ever plays Haydn, they know that I've done a lot of Haydn with my chamber orchestra in Switzerland. I had a, a six years, a very good chamber orchestra. And all the Haydn's and all the Beethoven's were there. That's an information that they sort of have here. And then, you know, okay, when we do the tour, it can't be too big, it isn't... Haydn. That is a way of dealing with programming, that you discuss um, the, the works you want to do. Then, there is another way. I know orchestras, and I say with the BBC orchestra, I want to do this and this and this, because that's what they can do very well. Or with the BBC Orchestra, I want to do this and this and this, because that's a thing that they never do. So it's always like um, if you would invite me to come to your house and have a good dinner, uh, a six-course dinner, you would be very careful in what you would present me. And making a program is like making a good menu. Not to be overeaten, not too uh, little. That's even worse. <laughs> um, so, in terms of making a program, uh, as a general music director, you are respons I'm responsible in, in my opera house for the whole season. So, I make themes. I make either a Shakespeare line or a Goethe line, or you do uh, only a year with a composer in residence. And so, you can point out certain anchors for the season. But as a guest, um, you are asked 
to, uh, f uh, to conduct a certain repertoire that fits in their schedule. I'll give you an example. I go to Ulster next season, and I'm a big Bruckner uh, fan, and I, I'm known for my Bruckner in Germany. I know what I do with, with this enormous cathedral music. And they wanted to do Bruckner. I said, okay, let's do Bruckner 6, because that's the thing I've not done the last six years. I want to do that again. And then they've just done it. Then you are out. Then you can choose. Or, or either you don't do it, or if they say, no, it must be Bruckner 3. And then I said, okay, let's do Bruckner 3. It's, I mean, Bruckner 6 or Bruckner 3. It's Bruckner. <laughs> so then you end up with another Bruckner symphony, but still it's Bruckner. Huh? And um, in terms of studying, that's one advantage of traveling. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm pretty alone. And I mean, I have 60, 70 musicians now, but um, I hardly, I, I, it's, it's not, for me, not good to talk to people and to get too friendly. Other people will yes. tell, he's with her or with him, or I don't want it. So what I do is I take my repertoire for tomorrow, I have it in my case, and every free hour after breakfast, this hour before we leave in the bus or in the car, uh, to the next venue, I have the score for the next program, and I'm inhaling that score till the moment I'm here. Now I, I don't think of my program tomorrow, because tomorrow afternoon, 2 o'clock, I have a rehearsal. But it's all there, and that's what I do in traveling. That's the advantage of sitting in an airplane or in a taxi for hours and hours and hours, and then you learn the scores. So in a certain way, I don't need orchestras or pianos or instruments. I, as you read a book and you see an oak tree, then you read an oak tree and you see sort of, then you don't see a lavender whatever plant. You see the oak tree. And if I read a score, I hear exactly what they have to play. That is, that is it's nothing special. It's just some people have it and others don't. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now I'm conscious of time. We need to let you get ready. I just wonder if you have any brief advice for um, young aspiring conductors? There's one question this gentleman has. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. And, and, no, no, and please. And ask ask you, can you remember the first piece of music you conducted and was you happy with it? it the first piece uh, I conducted was in school, uh, La Création du Monde, The Creation of the World by Mio for Chamber Orchestra. And I never forget that because, as you can imagine, if I have to do a new piece, give me two days and I have it in my mind. That piece took me about six months to learn. <laughs> but I never forget it. And if I see that score, and I, if you wake me up in the middle of the night, three o'clock, and you say, here's an orchestra, do Création du Monde Mio, I'll do it. <laughs> so it's a certain, also, you know, marathon, running marathon. And you do that as a child, you get a certain physical aspect, and I get a sort of uh, <clears throat> psychological aspect to the music. Well, thank you. Well, or ring us back later and let us know how we got on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the aspect of young conductors, the best advice is what I also do in class, um, stay honest to the music. I'm not interested in the person, mm -hmm. I'm interested in the music and what he or she does with it. Um, if they are sort of thinking, oh, I can be more effective with an extra crescendo, or there's only one conductor that could get away with it because he was a genius, and that's Leonard Bernstein. He, if I see scores marked up by Bernstein, or I hear recordings, he changed the whole thing for the better as a composer. He was, and then you see crescendos and an extra forte in the timpani, and everybody was thrilled on the night that you were sitting with Bernstein. If you listen back to the record, you can see the score. And, uh, we, are, we are talking about a different piece. So, <laughs> young conductors, stay, stick to the score. Stick to these geniuses that we have, the Prokofiev's, the Haydn's, the Schumann's, and the Tchaikovsky's that you hear today. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to the concert. The concert on Friday night in Bangor was wonderful. It was amazing. Was wonderful. Yeah, were wonderful. Great. And it was a different program, but mm. we enjoy every minute that we can make music for you. And, we know that um, that's hard to keep the classical, romantical repertoire going. So I'm very grateful that you are there and I hope you enjoy yes. the afternoon. Join us again for the last concert of the season on Sunday the 13th of May. Our finale features the Berlin Symphony Orchestra with music from Beethoven, Mozart and Brahms. And don't miss our pre-concert interview with pianist Kit Armstrong. Watch out for more events and updates available on our website www.venuecumry.co.uk